Good morning, brothers and sisters of Treesmill Memorial Presbyterian Church. Welcome to today's Sunday service on March 29th of the year 2020. I hope everyone is safe and sound, and your family is safe and sound and cozy, and I hope that you are not too bored with what's happening. Just one brief announcement is that our next Sunday service, that would be the Palm Sunday service for April 5th, 2020. It will be, we will continue to have our service like this online because the church will be closed on that Sunday. It is, it is due to the government mandate that came into effect on Tuesday, March 24th, that they order all non-essential services to shut down for at least two weeks. So uh, everything will be closed down, all non-essential services will be closed down by government mandate until April 7th. And so our, uh, our service next Sunday just so happens to be on the 5th. So in accordance with the government mandates and the law, we will not have, uh, unfortunately, our doors will not be open, but we will have our Sunday service online like this once again. So this is the announcement for now. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And today's call to worship is taken from our fifth Sunday in Lent. God set the prophet down in a valley of dry bones, asking, Can these bones live? Commanding, Hear the words of the Lord, promising, I will put my spirit in you. You shall live. Jesus wept at the tomb of his friend, hearing the grief Lord, if you had been there, knowing the doubt, could not he? Commanding life out of death, Lazarus, come out. We are tempted by hopelessness and despair. In our own pain, at the world's brokenness, saying, our bones are dried up. Our hope is lost. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Let us pray. Creator God, we wait for you and in your word we hope. For with you is steadfast love and great power to redeem. Help us to trust you and to share your resurrection life with all people and the whole creation. So may all be raised from despair to hope, from darkness to light, from death to life, through Jesus Christ, who is the resurrection and the life. Amen. And now, let us sing our opening hymn. That would be hymn number 299, Holy, Holy, Holy.
Let us all pray the opening prayers of adoration and confession together. God of the past, present, and future, God in whom all things are renewed, we praise you. In the face of all that worries us and worries us, your words echo through the centuries with love and hope. As we follow the footsteps of Jesus in this Lenten season, his cross stands before us. And so we trust you are never far from our sorrows. In him, you walk with us. You share our tears. You stand beside us when we don't know which way to turn. In this hour of worship, renew our trust in your resurrection promises and draw near to us when we need you the most, whenever we can't even find the words to call on your holy name. God of lonely places and hard times, there is no place dark for your presence. There are no situations beyond your grace. Yet, we confess we sometimes lose track of you. When sorrows stack up, own loneliness surround us. Forgive us our hopelessness. Stay with us as we go through every valley of shadow. Bring life where there is death. Healing where there is pain and courage where there is fear. Stay with us as we make our way along the path Jesus walked. In Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together as, to, as his people. The Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Friends, remember the promise St. Paul declares. What will separate us from the love of Christ? Hardship, distress, peril, or sword? No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through the God who love us. Neither death nor life, nor things present, nor things to come can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. So let us rejoice that no matter what is happening around us, no matter what we have done, God's deep love will never let us go. Amen. And now it is children's story time. Today's scripture is from John chapter 11. Verse 25 to 26. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live, even though he dies, and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Have you ever seen the movie Jungle Book? It tells the story of a boy, Mowgli, who lives in the jungle among the animals. He is trying to make his way back to the human village, and along the way he meets ve many very interesting characters. There's Mad King Louis of the Apes, and the lovable, happy-go-lucky bear named Baloo. He even meets a group of vultures, who pledge their friendship in a song called That's What Friends Are For. The, the, the words of the song goes like this. I, I'm not very good with the song, so I will just read out this, um, the words to you. The words of the song are this. We are your friends. 
We are your friends. We're your friends to the bitter end. When you're alone, who comes around to pluck you up when you are down? And when you're outside looking in, who's there to open the door? That's what friends are for. Do you have a friend who is always there for you? One who cheers you up when you're feeling sad. One who stands by you, no matter what. We could all use a friend like that, couldn't we? Our Bible lesson today tells a story about that kind of a friend. There was a man named Lazarus, who lived in Bethany with his two sisters, Mary and Martha. They knew Jesus and were his good friends. One day, Lazarus became sick. His sisters sent word to Jesus, saying, "Lord, your dear friend Lazarus is very sick." But Jesus was in another town, and didn't come right away. When Jesus finally arrived in Bethany, Martha ran to meet Jesus and told him that Lazarus has been dead for four days. If You had been here, my brother would not have died. Jesus answered, "Your brother will rise again. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believe, whoever lives and believes in me, will never die." So Martha went back, and got her sister Mary, and they took Jesus to show him the place where Lazarus was buried. When he arrived at the tomb, Jesus told them to roll away the stone that covered the entrance. He prayed to his father, and then he called in a loud voice, "Lazarus, come out!" Do you know what happened? Even though he has been dead for four days, Lazarus walked out of the tomb. He wasn't dead. He wasn't even sick. Wow! How would you like to have a friend like that? Well, you do. Jesus loves you just as he loved Lazarus, and he wants to be your friend. He will pick you up when you are down. He will be with you to the bitter end. After all, that's what friends are for. Let us pray together. Dear Jesus, you said, "Greater love has no one than this." Then he lay down his life for his friends. Thank you for being our friend. Amen. And now, let us sing our next hymn. Our next hymn will be hymn number ninety-one. Out of the depths, I cry.
Today's responsive reading is from Psalm chapter one thirty, a song of ascents. Out of the depths I cry to you, Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who can stand? But with you there is forgiveness, so that we can, with reverence, serve you. I wait for the Lord; my whole being waits, and in His word I put my hope. I wait for the Lord. More than watchmen wait for the morning, more than watchmen wait for the morning. As well, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love, and with Him is full redemption. He Himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. And today's New Testament reading is from the letter to the Romans, chapter eight, verse six to eleven. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, He who raised Christ from the dead. Will also give life to your mortal bodies because of His Spirit who lives in you. And today's gospel reading is from the Gospel of John, chapter eleven, verse one to forty-five. The death of Lazarus. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, "Lord, the one you love is sick." When he heard this. Jesus said, "This sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it." Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was for two more days. And then he said to his disciples, "Let's go back to Judea." But Rabbi, they said, "A short while ago, the Jews there tried to stone you, and yet you're going back." Jesus answered, "Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble, for they see." By this world's light, it is when a person walks at night that they stumble, for they have no light. After he had said this, 
He went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and for your sake I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Then Thomas said to the rest of the disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. Verse 17, Jesus comforts the sisters of Lazarus. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus has been dead in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha, Martha had heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah the Son of God, who is to come into the world. After she said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house, comforting her, noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man kept this man from dying? Jesus, verse 38, Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. Jesus once more deeply moved, came into the tomb, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But, Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, 
Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, "Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me." When he had said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, "Lazarus!" Come out! The dead man came out. His hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen, and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, "Take, take off the grave clothes, and let him go." Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary, and had seen what Jesus did. Believed in him. May the Lord bless the hearers of His word. And now, let us sing our next hymn. Our next hymn will be hymn number three hundred and eighty-four. O breath of life, come sweeping through us. Try. 
Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. His name above all names shall stand, exalted. the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today's message is mostly based on the Gospel of John. The title is, If You Had Been Here. We know that a lot of things can happen in our life. Sometimes it caught us unaware. Sometimes we expected it. Sometimes there is a solution. Sometimes we are left hopeless and helpless. When that time comes, what do we do? What is our response? Then this reminds me of a joke. One time a terrible storm came into town and local officials sent out an emergency warning that the riverbanks would soon overflow and, the, and flood near nearby homes. They ordered everyone in the town to evacuate immediately. A, faith, a faithful Christian man heard the warning and decided to stay, saying to himself, I will trust God, and if I'm in danger, then God will send a divine vehicle to save me. The neighbors came by his house and said to him, We're leaving and there is room for you in our car. Please come with us. But the man declined, I have faith that God will save me. And as the man stood on his porch, watching the water rise up the steps, a man in a canoe paddled by and called to him, Hurry and come into, come into my canoe, the waters are rising quickly. But the man again said, No thanks, God will save me. The flood waters rose higher, pouring water into his uh, living room and the man had to re retreat up to the second floor. A police motorboat came by and saw him at the window. We will come up and rescue you, they shouted. But the man refused, waving them off. 
Use your time to save someone else. I have faith that God will save me. The flood waters rose higher and higher, and the man had to climb up to his rooftop. A helicopter spotted him and dropped a rope ladder. A rescue officer came down the ladder and pleaded with the man, "Grab my hand, and I will pull you up." But the man still refused, folding his arms tightly to his body. No, thank you. God will save me. Shortly after, the house broke up, and the flood waters swept the man away, and he drowned. When in heaven, the man stood before God and asked, "I put all my faith in you. You have let me down, God. Why didn't you come and save me?" And God said, "Son, I sent you a warning." I sent you a car. I sent you a canoe. I sent you a motorboat. I sent you a helicopter. What more were you were you looking for? In today's passage, doesn't it seems like that the attitude of both Mary and Martha is like the man who was trapped in that joke? Let us recap on the circumstances that Mary and Martha was in, and the background that what Jesus was in. In the beginning of this chapter, we were immediately told that Lazarus was sick. We did not know how bad his sickness was until we read later that he died. So he was very, very sick. At his deathbed, when Jesus received word, what was Jesus's reaction? Jesus continued his ministry for two more days. Now we can ask, how come God can be so heartless? How come Jesus, the man who was recorded to love Martha and Mary, And of course, love us. Did not act immediately. We found that Jesus was、uh, that Lazarus was so sick that by the time the message was reached Jesus, he is dead. Even when Jesus hurries to the village of Bethany, it will be too late. We see later on in the scripture. That by the time Jesus arrived at Bethany, Lazarus was already buried for four days. That means Lazarus was dead for an even longer period of time. So when Jesus received word, Lazarus was already dead. We cannot discount Jesus's love for others. Because Jesus risked his life to go to Mary and Martha. In the previous chapter, and how and what has happened before in chapter ten, the Jews were going to stone Jesus to death because they were angry, especially due to that Jesus claims that he is God. Hence, we can see why Jesus's disciples were hesitant in going back. Into Israel, so we can see that Jesus risked his life. With just this this small factor, I can relate the Jews to us, to humanity, isn't it? Isn't it many times that when we don't get what we want, or happy with what we want or what we got, we blame God? We were prepared to kill God. To reject God, to discount God, and to take or to take God out of our lives. Yet, God continues to work in our lives, continues to initiate. And what I found the most interesting setup in this life event was that Jesus said in verse four that this sickness. 
will not end in death. No. It is for God's glory so that God's Son may be glorified through it. It sounds like what Jesus has, has said this before, doesn't it? From last week's, uh, week's scripture, Jesus said that the blind man was there for the glory of God. What Jesus really means was that the blind man's condition was not his and not his parents' fault, but as a way for God to show God how God's reaction is, and that is love. He also reflects on us, on how when we are faced with similar circumstances or challenges, how should we act? How should we respond? The Reverend Dr. Alice M. McKenzie said, In the God-human relationship, the response of the human being to God is a crucial contributor to growth in discipleship. And that is a tough thing to do. Both in discerning what to do and how to do it with love. We can see here in Lazarus' case, it is for Jesus to show Jesus' identity and to show how God loved and stayed by humanity. And we see later, the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. Jesus grieved with both Mary and Martha and resurrected Lazarus. Yet, even when some people who has witnessed this miracle, they still do not believe. As what Jesus has prophesied, that people's hearts are so hardened that even when people rise from the dead, they will not believe. We too can relate to that, don't we? It, re it really re makes me reflect on how should our responses should be. How we should, by faith, see the signs by God and the explanations that goes along with it. The theologian Gary M. Burge said about this story. This is what he said. He said, Here is the raw vulnerability of our lives stands naked. And we are confronted by a personal fate we would rather not look at directly. Martha and Mary met face to face with such horror. They faced death, especially death of a loved one. And what was their first reaction? And when they faced Jesus, they both said, of course, separately, they said the same thing, Lord. No, they said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Now, let us step back and reflect upon what they have said. You know, I know that with the English language, it's a truly a marvel thing to have. Because we can have many different tones. And because of that, the, and the meanings and the ways to say it changes. So, you know, there's a way that when we read this, the first thing that we can think of, we can read it as one that, of, of one how someone or a friend missed something fun. You no, know, we would say, oh, too bad. You know, too bad you missed it. If you had been sooner, you would have enjoyed it, you know, in a, in a friendly or nice way, right? Or we could say it like in, you know, you're up in stage, seeing the two audiences. If you were here, then you would know what this would happen, right? And, you know, very, very showmanship-like. But we know these two doesn't really reflect, right? We know that with their temperament, with Ma Martha and Mary's temperament, it's not that. Or we could say as a matter-of-fact way, when someone missed something important, yet not critical to their lives, it says, oh, you know, if you had been here, it would be better. But, oh, well, you know, yeah, let's give or take. Or we could here read this as an accusatory tone, right? 
if if you had been here, then this would not have happened. We would have. We this shouldn't have. This this that right. We would imagine you know, in a very angry or accusatory tone, or it could be said in a very desperate way. Oh God, you know, if you were here, you would know what to do. If you were here, Lazarus would not have been dead. You know, we could think of many different ways. You know, we could read this in many different ways about how they talk to to Jesus. Then we could ask the questions: What kind of attitude that the sisters were in? How they said their fir- what were they were what were their first words to Jesus? How did they say their first words to Jesus? And what do they mean by it? I'll let you decide and imagine. I think you can imagine and decide more than I could. But then, you know, I can see myself as the sisters. Right? When something was going good and well, did we invite God and say, "Oh God, if you were here, you would have enjoyed and savored this precious moment when I put perfect in my test, and I'm very happy." Right? Or maybe sometimes we would be like, "Oh God, you know, you know, if you have just if you have been here, you would just tell me, then I would know what to do. Or if you were here, God." Either giving me a sign or talk to me, let me know. Maybe somewhat of an accusatory tone, right? And then dot dot dot. These might sound very familiar. It sure does sound familiar to me, as I have asked these questions in the past, in many various ways, right? In the different descriptions I had talked about, how we read this. Don't we go through disappointments and many questions to God? Some people even reacted with rejection and denial of God. Then what does it really mean, though? What does it mean when we feel that there is a silence of God? It was even noted in the Bible, the period between the Old Testament and the New Testament, God. Did not show any revelation, or talked to anyone. And and the period between those, the old and the new testament, is a few hundred years. The Reverend Alice Mackenzie said, that it becomes increasingly clear that one's response to Jesus is a matter of life and death. How did I go through this? How should we respond? Even though misguided and missing the point of Jesus' coming, the sisters Martha and Mary has shown something to hold on to. That is faith and hope in God. Theologian Veronese Miles said about the sisters. This is what she said. The finality of death deepens the grief of Mary and Martha, and their disappointment that Jesus has not arrived until now. They trust him as a teacher, a healer, a miracle worker. In their case, unfortunately, they were thinking about keeping Jesus,、uh, Lazarus alive. And not about getting the point of Jesus, the Messiah, being there to save all mankind from death and sin. That Jesus is the life. How does that get to us? The simplest would be faith and hope in God, despite not knowing what will happen in the future. In spite of getting what we want. In spite of not having everything wrapped up neatly and solved in our lives, in spite of facing challenges every day, we still have our faith and hope in God. Faith that God works in our lives, and hope that with each passing day, we. 
get closer and closer to God, closer and closer to a joyful life. We see that despite God being quote quote silent, God is still with us. God is constantly loving and grieving with us. We see that in Jesus' tears of love, his tears of anguish, and of his heart being torn apart. We see that with faith and hope in Jesus, we are to be resurrected continuously as well. And that this makes me think, isn't it sometimes that some things happen in life that want us to make us give up? No, want us to lose something of our lives or, or make something that died in us? Doesn't it sometimes when life happened, you know, we just let it go? This letting go is not something that we, you know, holding something tightly and then the things that is holding us back. No, this letting go is like giving up. Why? Right? It's the letting go of something that will help us live our lives fully as ourselves. So we're giving up part of us, giving up that part of us that helped us to live and not just and then making us, you know, just go day by day, just survive in this world. And in this regard, it is like another step towards giving up. I would call that another step, another type of death. A death of character. A death of identity. A death of living. A death of living life to your potential. A death to relationship. Then, we too need the resurrection like Lazarus. People who are recovering from this death, resurrected from the many deaths that we have experienced in life, I mean spiritual death, and the death in the soul. that require caring communities to both nurture and strengthen. And this is what Jesus wants of his bride, of his church. We see that when Jesus met the sisters, you know, he didn't say, well, too bad he is dead, right? Or too bad I'm late. I'm sorry I'm late, you know. Jesus didn't say, I have done all I can. What can I do? Jilin say, didn't say, oh, I'm here, aren't I? Isn't that enough? Jilin di Jesus didn't berate them. Jilin Jesus didn't explain. Jesus didn't say excuses. Jesus didn't dismiss. Jesus didn't reject. And Jesus didn't say bad things about them. And also, Jesus didn't go on a tangent about teaching, right? Teaching them. Jesus didn't say, if you believe in the resurrection, then why are you still wasting your time with your tears? Jesus didn't say that. Jesus didn't say, oh, if you have a victorious faith, then you could have stand clear-eyed and confident because I am here. Jesus didn't say that. In just, instead, Jesus just wept. Jesus wept with them. That means Jesus has nurtured them and given them the strength by reassuring them that it is okay to grieve. It is okay to feel sad. It is okay to have these reactions. And it is okay to feel pain and to express them. Jesus is not like the world leaders we have. The leaders, the icons, the celebrity that we admire and follow. Jesus is also not like the cultural icons, the cultural leaders, or whatever leaders we have in our textbooks. None of them wept like Jesus. Some leaders will even have the responses, I'm here, aren't I? See, I'm here, I'm here. So what do you want me to do? And then exclaiming incredulously and would say, Oh, I couldn't do anything else. 
and then dismiss it, etc. But not Jesus. Jesus wept. Theologian James O. Duke sees this story that shows that God is with us, despite what we feel, despite what we think, despite what we believe. He said, "The raising of Lazarus then signifies that God's final or end of life promises, or we call them." Eschatological. God's final promises are here and now, already being realized amid and despite the ordinaries of the course of life. So, when such things happen, let us not ask the question, "Where were you?" But instead, towards God and focus on God's life, love. Just like what Jesus did, the pastor Gary M. Burge said, "It is a place of victory and life, not sorrow and defeat." Let us pray together. Let us pray in the prayers of thanksgiving and intercession. Let us pray for each other. O、oh、God, we thank you that in Christ. You call each of us by name and unite us in His body, the Church. Give us love enough to make a difference in Your world, and trust enough to follow even when the way before us is a challenge. O God of peace and promise, in Christ You call us to love our enemies and to be peacemakers in the world You love. We pray today for people and places divided by ancient bitterness and current hostility. O God of the bruised and broken, we are grateful that in Christ you have taken up the cross and know by heart the things that bring us suffering and pain. We pray today for all those in need of healing and comfort. Whatever the source of their pain, O God of the lonely and sorrowing, in Christ you face the loss we know, when loved ones die or when friends let us down. We remember before you those who grieve the loss of their loved ones, and those who face a lonely future. O God of hope and new possibility, in Christ you open the way into the future for us through the power of your redeeming love. Give us the courage we need to face our future, assured of your presence and power to sustain us. We offer that all that we are and all that we hope for, through Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. And now, let us sing our ending hymn together. That will be hymn number six hundred and seventy-eight. I'd greet thee, who my sure redeemer art.
Let us go now and delight in doing God's work, leaving our fingerprints in places where God would want them to be. And now, may our Creator direct your ways so that you may always walk upon His road. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and every day. Amen.